there is no information available on the Malaysian Estates Staff Provident Fund in any form in academic or non-academic sources or in related field of literature. Nothing can be found in the National Archives. And to me, uh, reading that I think is amazing that uh, you could have written a book this thick. I, I'm shocked beyond belief. Uh, well written, uh, well articulated. And I must congratulate both the uh, uh, writers. Uh, the second writer, Mr. Viswanathan Selvarathanam, on uh, Michael Stenson's uh, classic work, Class, Race, Colonization, Colonialism, uh, which is another fantastic uh, book. I know it's not easy to write a book uh, because it took me myself just to write about uh, 80 pages, it took me. Uh, roughly half my life. Uh, so I, I know it's, uh, it's not that easy, but I, I suppose uh, good writers like you all have taken a, a shorter time and had more breathing space and research to be done. But uh, very interesting, the themes that were discussed, I think that is uh, most uh, uh, very near to me uh, in relation to the Indian community, uh, basically on uh, economic exploitation, economic marginalization, inequality, the question of welfare and the question of economic justice remain of the utmost importance until today. The history of the, the whole thing, if you look at the, both the books, doesn't differ from many of us who are from the estates or those who have left out or from the uh, days when uh, we had to work in the uh, uh, estate background. I find uh, interesting uh, background uh, has been written about this kind of people and obviously how it has transformed over the time to now uh, well uh, it's hardly you, when, when you want to say about uh, Indians working in the estates you hardly find uh, many Indians in the estates nowadays which is good and bad good in the sense uh, uh, where there's no place where there's no electricity and uh, water uh, you come to a better place to live in Bad in the sense, most of us who left the, from the estates, which has a lot of uh, background written in both the books, uh, shows that uh, uh, urban the, the crisis that the Indians go through in this country is because of all this, because of urbanized, ur urban uh, displacement and uh, urban poverty has come into being. And uh, Mr. V. Samaratnam has uh, in his notes. It is after a word on Stephen Stenson's book, The Plantation Economy, which absorbed so many Indian laborers, including my own parents, had changed significantly in the last 60 years. But now we are talking about uh, others who are working in the States, the Bangladeshis, the Myanmar's, uh, and other people. And I think at the end of the day, the, uh, the, the situation of uh, wages is a very uh, a pertinent matter. Some of you uh, may think that uh, Kula can just bring uh, overnight change. I wish I could. After uh, obviously, I thought all this it was like that when I was in the opposition. By reason, you've got a lot of uh, stakeholders to discuss with. You've got a lot of reality things to step in, and uh, with all these limitations, it's not going to be easy. But those are things that has to be answered, whether you like it or not. But for me, both the books shows focus on the role of employment. And I think that's most uh, uh, very important. And even now, that, that is one of the factors uh, which is so relevant to the Indians in this country. But in the uh, urban sector, in where the majority of the Indians have settled down, now, at this juncture, I can only hope and ask the Indian community, especially those who have considered themselves is not so fortunate to take up the opportunities that are available. Not so much opportunities that uh, you have you have to go and get a job and that kind of thing. We, we, we got a major problem in this country where because of full employment, 3.6%, hovering around that, it's difficult to get uh, local workers. But I think to get uh, ourselves uh, uh, to realize that the future of work, of this whole world, is dependent on your skills. And uh, somehow, Regrettably, Malaysia has not changed on the mindset where uh, 
parents tell parents tell you from birth to the time you finish uh, form 5 form 6 that you have to go and get an academic qualification you must go to university and get a degree and i think that's the most uh, unrealistic thing now if you look at uh, what's happening in germany and uh, other more advanced countries like korea taiwan and japan invariably the importance of technical studies come into play and the government is giving more focus on that and the bhi in my own ministry is uh, ministry the tvs technical vocational educational training institutes unfortunately the uh, uh, registration of the number of students from the uh, chinese and malay communities is is hardly 10% and i and i don't blame uh, the children because the parents are giving emphasis on going to universities and uh, i'm happy to note that uh, it took me a long time to convince the prime minister finally he has agreed that uh, there must be a re look at the whole focus of this government as to whether academic qualifications and those who are studying in humanities and all that are uh, can complement to the growth of the economy yes we require those kind of people but not in the quantum that we have now it should be reduced and he has agreed and in fact in the coming uh, budget i think there will be substantial change and move on to uh, greater investment in uh, In, in workers and uh, in especially uh, the need to go and skill reskill and upskilling and this is one of the uh, basis uh, which we want to do the uh, our push i am also compelled to say that i i look at the way uh, both the books have been done the focus on world welfare has been paramount and i am also very grateful that uh, over the time the malaysian indians had this little bit of advantage of unions one way or the other state bodies and civil society and in particular like national life finance which has helped many people i am proud to say that i became a lawyer because i took a loan to study from national life finance if not for national life finance i don't think i would have come for, would have finished my studies i want to thank uh, thank uh, dato for the help in this for many indians in this country and in, in this context i want to recall the great lawyer vira sami who died uh, at a very young age in ipo when i uh, i'm not from ipo <coughs> my home town is city on uh, when i went to ipo i saw this jaran vira sami what in which vira sami is this for i know there flower there's one flower running a coffee shop in in bunto i thought that vira sami but by the time i wanted to ask him many years he has already passed away so i couldn't confirm with him but then i realized there was a book written about uh, vira sami this vira sami was a great lawyer who articulated specifically for estate workers all around the country he was at one time a member of the uh, legislative assembly uh, unfortunately he died very young uh, at about 40 40 early 40s uh, because he was he succumbed to tuberculosis but the important thing of him is i quoted him uh, his speech uh, in parliament on uh, how he had articulated for minimum wage way back in the 30s and 40s uh, it was not easy but he had articulated those uh, very vital issues of importance to workers by the same time having said about workers it's also important that there must be a strong uh, economy and there must be also great uh, big heart uh, employers we have to strengthen the uh, workers right there's no question and if you read the book of virasami you will know because i i felt very strong uh, about that matter this book also focuses a bit on uh, substantially on poverty many of us those who are from the estates and in the uh, uh, this kind of areas would have uh, substantially suffered from uh, social problems poverty inaccessibility to go to schools and uh, discouragement from everybody from going to school my my parents never encouraged me to go to school they were interested in asking me to go look after cows and goats and pigs uh, that was the order of the day that time but things have changed and we cannot just look at historical aspect of it and say uh, all can transform we have to take it upon ourselves and i think i i, I was uh, coming here today i was just thinking about the 
all of us were in similar background Malays, Chinese, Indians and Punjabis I somehow I find the Punjabis have done very well I think we must uh, emulate from them I mean, how, how they have done so these are things that also must I, I got a lot of Punjabi classmates and somehow most of them are doing very well if they are in politics also they do very well <laughs> if they are in hospitals also they do very well if they are fighting also they do very well <laughs> so I think we have to learn something from them uh, they, I, I urge them, my Punjabi friends who are here to share those uh, things with us and uh, finally, I, I thank uh, uh, all the parties for inviting me here today. My apologies that uh, I, I couldn't come earlier uh, to launch this book, both the books. But I think it is uh, absolutely a must read, well written, well articulated. I am uh, shocked beyond belief that uh, how anybody can write without uh, some form of uh, literature to be found uh, everywhere. It's not that easy, but uh, this book, I'm sure, has got a dark of uh, uh, important message to many of us. I, it's important to remember history so that we can move forward. I want to uh, finally thank uh, Mr. K. Armugam, my very good old friend. When I first entered parliament, uh, he was my research man. Not many body know, not many body knows about that, but he used to help me uh, substantially. So my early speeches in Parliament were all because of him, uh, which I, I didn't know how to do that thing, so he'll write and give it to me. Uh, and today, uh, I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to come here and with this great audience here. Have a, a great day and, uh, and I, I hope the writer will not stop here, but will write more. Thank you. history in Malaysia. Uh, we have three panelists to share their viewpoints and let me be, uh, let me uh, introduce the moderator. Yeah? Uh, I'm pleased to invite the forum's moderator, uh, Pa A. Halim Ali. Ali is a former professor of Nusantara in Unimas, was pro tem president of University of Malaya Socialist Club, former secretary general of Party Socialist Rakyat Malaysia. The floor is now yours, sir. can be a backdrop to our forum today, even if they are only tangent show to our discussion. Now, I'd like to make a brief observation on these two books. You will notice that the two authors and also the writer of the afterword chapter in Michael Stanton's book, V. Salvaratnam, they, be, they were contemporaries, they belong to the same generations. Stanton being born in 1936. They were young radicals in an era, to borrow Charles Dickens' uh, phrase, the best of times and the worst of times. Imperialism was dominant, and so was the reawakening of the colonized people. Imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism and authoritarianism were the worst of times at that time. The social and intellectual environments are reflected in their writings and of course with different intensity. Political economy was their choice. If you, if you look at the two, read the two books, 
which and they reject the notion that the market as an impersonal which reconciles and which accommodates the diverse wants of individuals. So with that, with that uh, backdrop to the discussion, I'd like to invite the participants of uh, our evening's discussion here. Yeah? Dr. Michael Jayakumar Devaraj. Dr. Michael Jayakumar Devaraj is a prominent member of Party Socialist Malaysia and a former member of parliament for Sungai Siput from 2008 to 2018. Please. A medical doctor by training, is author of numerous books on politics and social justice in Malaysia. Mr. Jayakum. Michael Jayakum. Uh, now I'd like to invite Professor Angulaman Ambong to the stage. Angulaman, please. Professor in Sociology of Development at the Institute of Malaysian and International Studies, University of Kabangsaan, Malaysia. He was president of the Malaysian Social Science Association between 2000 and 2010, a good decade. He's author of State Led Modernization and New Middle Class in Malaysia, published in 2002. Mr. And now the third speaker, an old friend, uh, Jayaraj Raja Rao, is the author. Raja Rao is the author of the Malaysian Estates Start Provident Fund and the Legacy of Mardak, Origin Development and contributions to the natural rubber industry. For many years, he worked at the Rubber Research Institute of Malaysia. Say rest, please come on. <laughs> okay, we'll start off with, uh, with you, Michael. Thank you. Good evening to everyone. So I've given 10 minutes to start off. I think if you look at Malaysia, I was talk about the plantation labor <coughs> and uh, Indian political history in Malaysia. If you look at the plantation sector, it is a major source of wealth for this country, you know, from before independence and right up to now. Not so much now, but coming up to the 70s, 80s, it was first rubber and later on oil palm. But it's quite a tragedy that the people working there, you know, the hundreds of thousands of estate laborers, and through the whole process, remain poor. And a few of them are still now, about, still about 100,000 estate relations working on their estates. And they still remain with low wages, at the minimum wage, about 1,000, 1,002 a month. Most of them don't own houses, they have hardly any savings. So it is an issue of how come a sector that produced so much wealth, not only for this country but also for Britain, you know, the people involved in it remain poor. It is a very important issue to conceptualize. And the problem is this issue has been uh, papered over, has been confused. Even right now, even people from the World Bank, people from IMF will come and tell us that we are poor because our productivity is low. You know, you guys are not well trained. That's why your wages are so low. But they never tell us why minimum wage here is 1,001. Our, our cleaners in school, for example, are paid 1,001. A cleaner in a school in Australia is paid 10,000 Malaysian dollars. Why is the minimum wage in the US, in the European Union, so much higher than ours? When a factory moves from Silicon Valley and it comes to the same factories in Bayern the Pass, wages here are only about one-sixth or one-eighth of what the same work 
the same productivity. So it's not productivity, you know. Something else is going on here. And what is going on basically is an unfair economic system where the imperial center for the last 300 years has been taking the surplus from the peripheries, including the colonies in Asia and Africa. But that reality is never talked about by IMF and World Bank. They'll come here and say, oh, you must train. You must do more training, you know, so you can move up the value chain. But can you move up the value chain? Because a lot of production now in the world is outsourced. The big, big companies in Europe, in America, in Japan, they outsource to Malaysia. They get a Tauke here and say, okay, he produces component for us, he'll give you the technology you produce. But they buy that component from that Tauke in, say, Penang, at about one-sixth the price, that a similar factory would operate in Japan or in America. They come here because they can save money. Now, if this businessman in Malaysia says, no, you pay me too low, give me a bit more, give me one-third the price that you're giving in the US, you'll say, go to hell, I'll go to my, my company in Thailand. Because these big global chains, they have branches elsewhere, and they play off these branches, well, not, not branches actually, but they have subsidiaries, they have outsourced to many countries. So if this outsourced business plan, capitalist, Malaysian capitalist, refuses to play ball with them, they'll cut down orders there. And therefore, they're high and dry, because that component, who else they use? Can only be used by that particular company, whether it's Apple or whichever big company, so that is the mechanism, you know. The mechanism is this bullying by a small number of companies in the West, which bully local companies to keep prices down. That is, that is the mechanism, not, not productivity. You can go and train all you want, get machiners, tools, and all that. This is the imbalance in the world economic system. Since the time of the, the British East India Company, Still goes on, of course, that company finished, but that, that same elite group. And then you get Oxford talking about how these guys are getting richer and richer. You know, I say, oh, now the top six fellas in the world have more wealth than the bottom 50%, right? You all see that in the papers once in a while. This is the mechanism. It's important that we recognize this, you know. If we recognize this, then we will see that our labor, not only estate labor, our factory workers and all that, are being underpaid for what they're doing. What they're producing is worth much more. But that price has been pushed down by these global chains of supply. Because of that, local producers have got to control wages so they can make some profits. So you can't, I don't my party members, you can't blame our local capitalists too much. I mean, of course, we can blame them. They're also part of the chain. You know, they are, they are the small, they are fish, but the bigger fish above them was screwing them up, you see? So you can't be completely angry with these guys. Because it's the whole system. The important thing in th for that is this, you know. If we cannot, we can make the argument, our party makes argument, that if you cannot pay them the proper wages, you know, as money wages, can we give them services? Can we give them, for example, subsidized housing, subsidized education, make our healthcare better, subsidized transport? And if you accept the argument I'm giving that these guys, our working class, are producing much more in wealth than we are giving them, they're recognizing. Then it's fair to give them something as a social way. It's no longer, see in Malaysia, under Mahadev's thing, subsidy is kind of a dirty word, is it? Some of subsidy is something like you're wasting money, you're creating laziness, you're encouraging weakness, you know? That is the perception. But if I, if I accept my, uh, my analysis, that we are under, grossly underpaying our working people for the last 50 years, last 80 years, last 150 years, then whatever we can give them is not enough really, you know? So I think it's important to change the mindset. A subsidy is not even enough for the amount they have sacrificed in their wealth, including the wealth of the world. You know? And the things we can do, you know, I mean like for example, there's still now there are much less people in the United States, you know, this, you know, 40 years ago there were 500,000 workers, now there are only about maybe 100,000. But they still don't have, have housing. So the government can ask all these big companies, including Sign W, which the government partly owns, right, to set aside some land, less than 1% of the estate area, 
take the land and ask build housing. If you don't have money, let's say you don't know your budget is tight, okay, take a bit more, sell half of it to developers, use the proceeds to do proper housing for workers. It can be done quite easily. But what's holding the, us back is partly this idea that we'll make them lazy, we'll make them weak. It's bad for the country, it's wasteful. So we've got to cut that out, you see. We've got to get the right understanding. The last point I'm bringing is Indian political history. I think the main effect of Malaysian Indian political system, also other Malaysians in the political system is, they've been part of the same process of befuddling our people. The problem now in Malaysia, in many parts of in the world, is the problem of wealth creation and who gets the wealth. And it's this global 1% just grabbing all the wealth for the last 200, 300 years. Instead of talking about that, what we do in our political system is we squabble about ethnic things. Oh, this quota not right, that quota not right, you're stepping on my language, you're stepping on my religion. So we actually, the political class in this country, for the last 50 years, is playing a very good role in turning people's attention away from the issue that really matters. And saying your enemy is the other ethnic group is taking too much, or he's insulting your religion, or he's doing, you know. We are doing a circus, you know. And this circus was started by the British. Because in the 40s, in the late 40s after the war, there was a multiracial coalition that called up the British. We had Postaman, for example, you know, Murdika Regandara, and saying that the white man should go, which should take the belt of this country and give it, share it, and all that. And they had, you know, MDU, they had the uh, uh, AMCJA, you know, there's a, there's a multiracial coalition that was actually quite anti imperialist, so it was quite nationalist, you know, independent, with the British hatred, right? They put Postaman in jail before they outlawed the Communist Party, right? Postaman in the jail, I think, in 47. So they basically broke that leftist analysis which called out the imperial powers and said, you guys are the guys making us poor. And they fostered an ethnic-based kind of political discourse in this country. Ethnic-based parties were given positions, were given place, were given scope to grow. Class-based parties were hammered on the head, you know, put in, put in detention, driven on the ground, you know, and ultimately crushed. And so this is the problem we have in Malaysia. Not only Indian politics, but also I think Malay politics and Chinese politics is quite pathetic. Because what we are doing is we're not solving the problem. We're helping World Bank and IMF obfuscate the issue. Show that, I mean, they are telling us you're poor because you are not productive. That is the main thing. So, the, so they don't tell the truth, is it? Because World Bank and IMF are set up to cover up what is going on in this world. And our political system goes along with that. Because we point racially. We, so that is the system. I, I'm sad to say I'm, I'm part of that political process. But, uh, but this is what is happening, really, you know? So I think what is important is we've got to understand. And if you look at Stenson, see how Stenson puts the whole issue. Listen, he starts off arguing that you cannot understand the problem of the Indian working class in Malaysia by its Indianness, it's not an ethnocentric thing. It's not because they're Indians, they're poor. It's because they are workers in a particular setup under colonialism, which is extracting the wealth to the center, and because they're part of that, that is why they're poor. That is very clear in that. Same thing we should do as well. Right now, why is there poverty? Why are there Malay peasants who are poor? Why are workers poor? We should look at how does Malaysia articulate the global economy, and how because we are a low-wage economy, we have a problem in raising wages. Raise wage too much, the guys will invest elsewhere. We will lose jobs. We'll have unemployment. Which is true. It can happen. But that is the reality. We've got to understand that reality first before we can see what we can do about it. The things we can do about it, they start talking about it. But the problem in this country is, under this present government, we're not even recognizing that that is the problem. We're not recognizing there's still imperialism. That, we, that Malaysians and other people in the third world are not being paid the value of their labor. That is a, that's the problem. Because if you don't recognize the problem, how can you even think, how can you even start thinking of ways of overcoming the problem? Anyway, with this, 
books like this, I think we should read, and not look at his books as very interesting footnotes in history. Rose Stenson, very good, talked about what happened in the past, clever man. It is very relevant to today. Stenson's approach is relevant to today. Stenson is saying you can't analyze Indian poverty by looking at Indians. You could see why, how the country is structured, what are the main economic and political forces, how do the workers fit into it, and understand it in a holistic, global manner. And I think his approach remains as relevant. It's not a historical footnote. It is a relevant, correct approach to understanding social issues. So I think I'll stop here. Okay. Thank you. The points that you, you raised, one is a critique of the supranational institution of IMF and the World Bank. And more importantly, I think, uh, you seem to regard the market as a political institution subverted by relations of power, namely between labor and capital. Uh, I think that was it. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to invite Professor Rahman to present his views. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Sada Michael Jayakuma and Saudara Jayaraj Kajarawat, the author of this book just launched by the Honorable Minister. Friends, old friends, new friends, I don't mean old in terms of age, but I think in terms of our friendship, I've been with many of you uh, uh, spending decades. And also the new friends who I have not met before, but whose names I've heard. It's very nice meeting you here at this auspicious, uh, on this auspicious location. And in this hall, um, which has got a history of its own. Um, uh, Sir Dr. Michael Jayakuma highlighted two important points. To me, two very important points uh, to kick off the discussion. But it's the, the system of inequalities, the, the capitalist system that has been inherited uh, from the past and how it impacts upon the uh, people, in particular the Indians, and the continued poverty that they are in, and so on, and the current um, problems that uh, the Indians, the Indian people face today. I will not go into details about that. And the second point that he made, which I think is also very important, and as a way for us to understand and also to act further on this problem is relating to uh, Indian political history, uh, which is uh, part and parcel of one of the main theme for the two books that uh, were launched this evening. Now, I, first I would like to um, say thank you and congratulate the, the gentlemen of yesterday, the young men of yesterday, who have produced this book, Raja Rao, for a wonderful book. And also the another young man who is not with us today, that's Stenson, who would be 83 today if he's still alive. And also very importantly, another the young man of yesterday, Dr. Selva Ratnam, who wrote, who crafted a very uh, nice, comprehensive uh, afterward uh, to the book by Dai Jaya and also to Jomo who wrote the foreword to Jaya, uh, Jaya's book. Uh, sorry, the uh, Selva is the afterword to Stenson and Jomo the foreword to uh, the, the book by Jaya. I think what strikes me about the books, these two books, is the window they open to a very important history that we must recognize and um, we have to, to, to put across to the people of this country. I think what the two books have contributed is to make us realize the significance of one of the important communities in this country who have together contributed to the country's independence and who also have contributed to the country's development, but whose role and contribution have not been 
very much appreciated or acknowledged. And I think these two books have put that clearly forward. I think the more books of this nature about the Indian community, about the Indian working class, and distributed and discussed, the better it is for us, so that the more knowledge we get, the more consciousness we have, the better for us, for us together in a multi-ethnic society like Malaysia, for the, for the Malays, for the Chinese, for the other communities, the Ibans and the Kadazans and so on and so forth, to understand and to appreciate, understand, appreciate and then to work together in order to bring change to the kind of conditions that uh, the Jaya Kumar talked about just now to improve uh, our situation. I think that's the first thing that, that strikes me. Uh, listening to Jaya and also to, to Michael Jaya Kumar just now and also after reading these two books and also having discussions with many uh, Indian friends. The second point that strikes me is we are talking here about the working class. The two books about talk about, uh, especially the Stenson's book, talk about the working class, about the proletariat. Who were the one of the earliest members of the proletariat in Malaya? The, one of the earliest, the Indian proletariat was one of the earliest proletarian class in this country. I think that fact has got to be underlined. Of course, you have got the Chinese uh, workers working in the deep mines, and then the Indian uh, proletariat on the rubber estates. And then through the colonial division of labor, we have that. And of course, the Malays were in the countryside, in the rural areas as farmers, fishermen, and so on and so forth. But the development of the colonial economy was done on the backs of Indian labor. Chinese labor, Indian labor. Malaya was known for its rubber and tin. And Malaya was the, one of the top, was the top producer of rubber in the world then. Now, now it's gone down. But who were the creators of, of wealth for Malaya? I mean, of course, the capital, the big capital who says yes. But it is the workers, the proletariat who produce the wealth for the big capital. Britain, the rubber and tin were the, uh, what they call the, the biggest dollar earner. Malaya was the biggest dollar earner for Britain. And the revenues, the income came mainly from the rubber and tin. And it is the Indian proletariat the workers and the rubber estates and so on and so forth, together with the others, who contributed towards that. And that has got to be very much appreciated, despite the fact that we are more than 60 years independence and so on, that the conditions of the uh, large number of the Indians have not really improved. Uh, There's that 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 something uh, that, that, that have we have got to them. To <coughs> I would say that this is, these are the, the unsung heroes who have contributed so much to the country's economic and political development and that this story has got to be told so that people understand that though the Indian community is a small, is a minority community but it is a very significant minority community that have played their big roles together with the Malays, with the Chinese and with the others uh, for the country's independence and for the country's national development. Now, the the third point that I would like to say about the significance of this discussion and the books that have been uh, that were launched just now is the fact that that knowing more, having more knowledge about the Indian community as much as about the other communities, will help us to think through, discuss, and come to some kind of consensus about the new national, the new Malaysian national narrative in order to go forward. History is important, very true. I mean, the two books have shown this. The minister also said just now that we have to learn from history. Those who don't learn from history are bound to repeat their mistakes made in history. 
And learning from history will enable us to draw some useful lessons about what kind of new Malaysian national narrative that we should have in order to move forward. How the, the people of various ethnic groups here, in this particular regard, the Indian friends, in this endeavor in order to move forward. Now, I would, how much time I have left? No, well, five minutes, okay, thank you. Let me have that, five minutes, okay. Now, I would like to draw a few points from the two books and to show that relevance, though they are based on history, but to show their relevance to the present and to the future. I think taking Stenson's book on class, race, and colonialism, I would like to mention three points. First is, of course, the framework of analysis, which is about imperialism and colonialism, about using the framework of uh, metropolitan center and the satellites, that development and, de and underdevelopment are two sides of the same coin. I think uh, Selva highlighted that point in his afterward. I think Jayakuma Michael highlighted just now, that development on the, of the metropolitan areas creates underdevelopment in this uh, uh, peripheries. It created winners and losers. Now, how can we turn that from, you know, so that we also can be winners in this kind of, uh, in this system? I think that framework of analysis put by Stanson can be looked at again uh, in, the, in the, the different context. That was 1970s, yeah, the era of when the chair just now talked about the worst of times and the best of times. The worst of times is imperialism, colonialism. The best of times is the camaraderie, the sense of solidarity among the people who fought against these evil forces. Now, we are, how do we strengthen that so sense of the solidarity of the people who fight against uh, the, the, the forces of domination, the one who have been winning so-called throughout uh, this, uh, this history. That's the first point. The second point that we can draw from Stenson, and uh, sorry to touch upon uh, by Michael, was the question of class and race, the intertwining between class and race. Now, we have been very much overwhelmed by the racial discourse or the ethnic discourse. And some, people, some scholars, some people talk about the ethnic paradigm or the race paradigm that has been dominating, being the dominant paradigm, being the dominant form of thinking that has shaped the kind of uh, uh, political discussions, discourse, and policies in this country. Now, to counter that, we have got the class analysis. And of course, this has been the, the, the contestations between the two have been going on throughout history and even today. Now, this book, especially Stenson's book, helps us draw our attention to the importance of looking at, in terms of class, that, that society and uh, ethnic communities are not homogeneous. They are divided into classes. That's the second point. The third point that I would like to highlight from Stenson's book is he talked about the factors that Become, that, that impeded working class alliance, working class coalition. And he mentioned two. One is the colonial division of labor. You know, the separation of Malays, Chinese, Indians, and so on in their respective economic enclaves. And number one. That's number, two. number two is separate political mobilization because of ethnic identity and all that. Now, of course, these two factors tend to impede cooperation between different ethnic groups. But as, but as we have seen in history, there was a period in our history, in the 1940s, 1946, 47, 48, that Putra AAMCJA was the first multi-ethnic coalition in this country that was directed towards British colonialism and 
that could manage to overcome the colonial division of labor in certain ways, to not some res in some respects, and that managed to overcome in some respects the separate political mobilization. In other words, the alliance came later. The alliance came in 1953, 55, right? Putra MCAJ was the first. Now, but what happened after that? It was the state that went in to suppress it, to arrest, as, as a result of which, uh, uh, after that, we have the emergency, we have got those people who avoided arrest, went into uh, the jungle and so on and so forth. So I think, I think that point is very important. That the work, the coalition, the multi-ethnic coalition, which is class-based, is very important. I think it's also very relevant today. Now, in the last two minutes, I would like to refer to uh, Jaya Ra's book. Some, some take home message from there. Uh, Jaya, not fair to you if I don't say that. Congratulations to you, 86, young man of 86 years old, producing a book of 424 pages long. It is a labor of love. I think that led you to the production of this thick book and and also love for labor. Love for labor. <laughs> Not just a labor of love, but love for labor for the goodness of the humankind. And this particular regard, of course, it is the first to be in the community, right? So well done on that. And you were very meticulous with your prime resources, the minutes, the annual reports, the correspondences and so on and so forth, and the interviews with uh, what do you call the key informants, etc. Et to produce the book. Now there are three, uh, there are two things that I would like to. One is the creation of um, the Malaysian estate staff problem fund, right? Now we all know about EPF. But we hardly know about this, and you are right when you mentioned that. But the context, when the British agreed to the setting up of ME Malaysian Estates, uh, Star Provin Fund, ME SPF, right? Yeah. The context was, was very, it was a kind of political turmoil, right? Political activism, political struggles, upsurge of uh, anti-colonial uh, movement at that time. It was born in on 17th July 1947. EPF was 1951. EPF was later. But that period was a period of political struggles. Yet the British agreed to have that set up, though it was only meant for the mid-level employees in the estates. Not for the ordinary workers, but still they consider, they make concessions. It was a concession. So I think the context is important because despite that, they made some concessions. In other words, they want stability. So to appease us, to appease the work the staff, Okay, set up this provident fund, it's a retirement fund for them, etc. etc. So in but it did not come out on a silver platter. It came out through hard struggle. I think that, that's point one. Uh, number two that uh, I would like to uh, draw some take home uh, take home message from your book is that though there is this context of political struggles and so on and so forth, but there is that um, understanding of the need for tripartite kind of relationship. That there was negotiation between the parties. Okay, the tripartism where I mean is that, well, of course the government, the state, capital, which means the employers, the British employers, and the people, the workers. So, agreement was going on. The struggles were going on outside. But there was this negotiations between the parties 
and which eventually led to the, this outcome. So the, the message that I can understand from there is that go on with the struggles, form alliances, have friends, make friends, make allies, lessen the number of enemies, but negotiate when necessary. I think that is the underlying message uh, from your book. With that, yes. thank you, Mr. Jaiman. I have two interesting points uh, raised by <coughs> Professor Rahman. One is the occasion, occasionally we, we, we forget that proletarianization uh, began with the Indian laborers. And that process is essential as a motive force of change in any, uh, any, any society. And point number two, briefly, is that the commonality between the two books is that they are more or less governed quite indirectly by the theory of dependency, thanks to V. Sarva Ratnam for pointing out in the uh, afterword that, that there is this, this uh, theoretical framework with which these two books operate. Now, those are the two interesting points. And now I'd like to invite I think I can be loud enough because I have some physical defects and I can't really hold this phone. So, but if you really can't hear me, just put up your hand and I will shout. <laughs> First, I hope the phrase, last but not least, will prevail as a fact, since I'm going to be the last speaker. <laughs> I'm going to say a few things as my opening gambit, as courteously as I can, and as procedurally correct as I can. Uh, first of all, on my own behalf and on all your own behalf, our thanks to the Minister for Human Resources, for giving us some of his very precious time to launch the book. Thank you, sir, although you may not be here. <laughs> Number two, I want to unreservedly thank the Malaysian Estate Star Provident Fund Board and its trustees for having a large measure of trust in me and commissioning me to write the book. They commissioned me liberally and generously. They sponsored the publication of book to Gerak Budaya and they have supported this event. So I would like to thank the board most sincerely. And if in the process of writing this book, which took me almost two years, and the process of publishing it took almost a year, and in the process of launching it, if there were some disagreements, let us say now, let those disagreements be agreed to agreeably. <laughs> Third, Gambit, the pawn is still moving. I would like to thank Dr. V. Selvaratna for mainly organizing this event which has been conceived for quite a few months, but finally the child has been delivered. And of course, he was ably supported by Gerard Budaya of organizing the various arrangements for this evening. So thank you, Dr. Selvaratna. Finally, in writing my book, there are innumerable people to thank for, but first, apart from the Malaysian Estate Staff Board and its trustees, there is that charming lady, Kala, who ensured that I had the minutes, the annual reports and correspondence for me to reach to, as was mentioned by the minister, I think subsequently by Emeritus Professor Rahman. There was no mention about MESPL, not even some of the books written by the Rubber Grows Association headquartered in England, and actually having an indirect strong control over this MESPF. 
So it was quite difficult for me to get information except thanks to the board for loaning me all these minutes, keeping them scattered on my table and working literally day and night out. Of course, thanks to my family for putting up with me. I'm not an easy person to be with, <laughs> but nevertheless, they put up with me. And of course, I thank the many academicians and colleagues who wrote the blurb. Raman Ebom was one of them. Dr. Selvaratnam was one of them. Professor Raja Rasaya, who wrote very objective reviews and have been published in the economic journals and Rubber Asia. And of course, Dr. Jomo Kwame Sundram, who is mentioned, who wrote the introduction. So I am, in fact, truly blessed. <coughs> Learned scholars and intellectual, rich and personal warm friends have really helped me at my late age, when I'm actually blind in one eye and the other eye is diminishing in sight. Thank you all very much. Now, I want to say very quickly, because time is very limited, a few things about Sanson's book. I repeat what all the others have said. It is relevant and topical, and so I congratulate uh, the Pusat Sajara Raya, headed by a very dear friend of mine, Said Hussein Ali, and Garak Bodea for daring to publish it again. And of course, congratulations again to Dr. Selvaratnam, who has written the afterword. And I think he has been sometimes more vigorous, more objective, and more rigorous in his review of the book. That in itself shows how relevant that book is for our time. History is never dead. History is alive for us to learn from it and move on to correct our past mistakes. So, at a time when very sadly our country is being divided by race and religious extremism, it is very important for us to go back behind and see who are the people who have really contributed. Professor Hamburg has already stated that the progress of this country was on the backs of the proletariat and especially the immigrants, the Chinese immigrants too. But those of you who don't know, the Chinese immigrants were only facilitated by the colonial government. The Chinese themselves brought the Chinese, largely employed them, and you will be stunned to know that they could be equally brutally treated by their Chinese employers as the European managers of the estates did to the Indians. So it is the poor people who, for their own little progress, who worked so industrially, slavishly, because they were treated literally like slaves, who worked hard, prospered the country, or, as has already been mentioned, for the coffers of the imperialist British colonialists, and of course, for the capitalists themselves. So, Stenson has clearly analyzed it. An amazing thing and a correct thing, which some of us pretend to forget is, the Indian community in itself was fragmented by clannishness, by their caste system. So they were never really united in the early days. They were all compartmentalized. It was so also with the Chinese with their Kongsi houses. The Teochew is a Teochew, the Hokkien is a Hokkien. And in fact, it has become so communalist. Uh, the Indian community, the joke today is, Malaya is being run by the Malayalis. <laughs> <laughs> Mahate from Kerala. A.G. Thomas, a Malayali, Matoma, Christian. And now the latest fearful, objective, strong lady, Latifa, born in Kerala. <laughs> so you see, and still we have lively communal organization, Amma, the Malayali body, Telugu Association, Jafna bodies, and so on. So on the outside, we all look one, united. But when you go deep into them, they still feel very proud. <laughs> That is their community who have done their best. And if you study statistically the development of the Indians, you will find different sectors 
doing very well. You know, the Salonis have done extremely well. So have the Punjabis. The only people who have really suffered are the Tamilians. I remember my history professor telling me many, many years ago, one Indian, he becomes a saint, saying his mantras. Two Indians are fighting with one another. Three Indians, they form a union. <laughs> and actually, many unions in the early days were formed by the Indians, guided and inspired by the MCP. So in the present day books, much of these things is not known because they brand the MCP, you know, as the worst body, the most brutal gorillas and so on. Even the Malaysian Socialist Party, I think, took 20 years, 20 years, I think, to be registered because our government thought they were communists. So anybody who leans left is a communist. So was I, branded as a communist and without a job for seven years and so forth. So that's that. The unfortunate thing, which I'm sharing with you about Stenson's book is, that while he talks about the developments and the difficulties, he also mentions various committees, subcommittees set up by the colonial government to elevate the problems that they were already beginning to witness and know as a fact because India was already independent. So they had to do something to pacify the harassed and hounded Indian immigrant labor. But he didn't mention that while all these committees were sent with marvelous objectives, they couldn't implement them because the RGA from England and even the UPMA here, and some of my friends from the MES board would know, S.B. Palmer, was questioning this kind of objective when it was necessary to revive the natural rubber industry. So he should have explained some of these ideals versus the acts, when the fine ideas never blossomed into good actions. And then the third thing that I would like to mention, of course, uh, sadly, Stenson died when he was quite young, 74, I think, and the published uh, book was published first in 1980. But he already witnessed the introduction of the NEP. And he mentioned it in a different wavelength that largely the emergency rule and the NEP were introduced because of racial riots. But if you read the personal words and comments by the first Prime Minister Tunku Abdul Rahman himself, you will realize that it was an organized riot. Pretending it was a riot between the Chinese and the Malays when in fact they were trying to oust him. These are available in the newspapers in some of the confessions by Tunku Abdul Rahman himself. So you see, Stenson did not elaborate it or discuss it very objectively. But nevertheless, he has recorded uh, the whole development of the Indian community and the race and the class system with a lot of facts. Briefly, my own book, Ebong has mentioned quite a bit, Although I have mentioned these things maybe uh, too forcefully, too fearlessly, I wanted to trap the actual facts of the difficult situations that everybody went. So maybe the first three chapters are not directly <coughs> relevant to the Malaysian Estate Star Provident Fund growth and development. But I wanted to say the oppression of the poor people, of the weak people, has been there from time immemorial. Slavery was condoned by all civilizations and sadly by all religions too. And then again, exactly how the British became accustomed to exploiting the colonials to gain wealth for their own country, for their own coffers. And it so happened also to Malaysia. But the marvelous thing is, we shouldn't look at it too often and too obsessively from the point of view of race. My own view, I don't accept the concept of race. And scientists, doctors like James said, there is no such thing as race. There's only one community, the human beings. And you see, in the Malaysian estate style, it was the white man, the owners of estate, 
who wanted to set up a kind of a provident fund to help their workers of a certain category to enjoy their later life. Of course, some unionists protested because they were not given the details or it was not discussed with them, a Malayali by the name of Menin in particular. Then, of course, you had the workers. So you had the unions, the workers, and the white men all coming together at one point. And my question, which I have intermingled it, maybe you might consider propaganda, why can't we, Malays, Indians, and Chinese, be united and make sure that our country progresses? Why should we still think about racial policies? Why need we have this useless NEP based on race and not on economics? And many things are still continuing based on race and religion. So my book, although talking about the difficulties experienced, you see there are individuals, and that's the most important thing, not God somewhere up there, but the kingdom of God is within you. The trustees voluntarily manage this board. Why? To help working class fellows from the rubber plantations and later oil plant plantations. That is the kind of example that we must follow. Help one another. And if we can do it voluntarily, so much the better. So those are the kind of views I have stressed. But the time being up, I shall stop now. And of course, you're free to ask me questions. So I would congratulate you all and urge every one of you always to think ourselves as human beings, caring for one another and working hard for the peace and progress and prosperity of Malaysia. Thank you.